In this clip, I draw on earlier Canadian videos by Steve Pomeroy and Stephen Gates to draw an Australia-Canada comparison on the pandemic policy responses in the homelessness and rental housing fields. So let's start by talking about the crisis action on homelessness that was seen um, at the start of the pandemic. In that, in that immediate aftermath of um, the pandemic coming to these two countries, both countries saw a huge and extraordinary effort to reduce infection risk for street homeless and sheltered homeless people. In each case, this included unusual levels of collaboration between levels of government, especially involving state or provincial authorities and municipalities. It also saw unprecedented state stroke provincial joint working with NGOs to get street homeless people into temporary hotel accommodation. More broadly, of course, both countries boosted income supports uh, and imposed evictions moratoria that at least temporarily helped to stabilize the housing situation and stem an immediate rise in new homelessness at that stage. And as Stephen Gates rightly argues, the pandemic has highlighted the risks faced by homeless people. And the reason for that is because our societies have failed to make proper provision for them in the past. The remarkable action of this, of this period, April or March, April 2020, was triggered by the public health argument that homeless people, street homelessness anyway, put people at high risk. Um, and this in turn magnified the public health risks for society at large. Even so, this argument did not hold sway everywhere. Notably, in Western Australia, no associated program was funded. This possibly reflects the local context where border closure and other measures meant that maybe no community transmission had become established, so the risk was considered to be less than in the eastern states of Australia where major rehousing programs were put in place. So, despite having over a thousand rough sleepers at the last count, uh, Western Australia had no emergency rehousing program that we were seen in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. More, I think we should then go on to talk about more fundamental action to counter homelessness, not just a, a crisis response. And Stephen Gates comments on this as follows. By focusing most of our investment, even to this day, on emergency services like shelters, day programs, soup kitchens, we put people at risk. The way that we manage homelessness, in other words, um, is, actually, is actually putting people in harm's way. And I think this Canadian comment could equally well apply to Australia. In both countries, recent enthusiasm for the Housing First principle has been a positive development when it comes to tackling street homelessness. That's something we've seen over the last five years or so. Also, in common between the two countries, on the other hand, is a long history of, in my view, overemphasizing crisis response, dealing with the symptoms of the homelessness problem rather than tackling its causes. This is partly about the lack of attention to active homelessness prevention. I'm talking here about reliable procedures or early intervention to minimize homelessness that results from institutional discharge or eviction. Neither Canada nor Australia has learned sufficiently from UK jurisdictions in this respect. A more challenging observation when it comes to government policy, especially in the Australian context, is that official tolerance for rising crisis services expenditure is unmatched when it comes to longer term investment in social housing. Prompted by the crisis, Toronto made an early announcement on construction of 1,000 units of new permanent supportive housing. And some Canadian, some other Canadian cities are following suit on a similar, what I would say is still a fairly modest scale, but at least taking action. But the only significant action by federal or provincial authorities in Canada has been British Columbia's motel acquisition and conversion program. Parallel developments in Australia have seen likewise small scale pledges on social housing stimulus investment by a number of Australia's state or territory governments. But these commitments add up to barely more than hundreds of additional homes in a country where the shortfall of social housing 
is on any measure in the hundreds of thousands, not the hundreds. Only if federal governments come to the party with nationally funded social housing programs are we going to see action at scale here. Proposals for a social housing stimulus have attracted quite broad-based support in Australia, and the possibility does remain in play. It's not been ruled out by, by government. We know it's still being contemplated. Similar calls have been made in Canada, but have likewise evoked no formal government response as yet. But at least in Australia, it's still being considered. Um, however, this is on the basis overwhelmingly of the employment boosting impact that it could have. Regrettably, the fact that Australian, the Australian federal government is still, we believe, considering the idea of a social housing stimulus, regrettably, that doesn't signal any sudden acceptance that boosted affordable rental provision is a fundamental strategic priority in housing policy terms for, for, for the longer term. So just, I think, to step back for a moment and, and talk briefly about the backdrop to the current situation um, in terms of rental housing availability or affordable rental housing availability in the two countries. Both countries have seen the, a, a contraction in affordable housing availability over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So in common, um, we've seen not only the near absence of even nominal growth in government subsidized social housing for 20 to 25 years, but also this contraction of low rent private tenancies as well. And Steve Pomeroy's um, comment on this in, in his earlier video clip says, it's been going on for 20 years or more, this trend, but we can see here in the last five years, a dramatic erosion of what he calls the naturally occurring affordable housing across Canada in total. We lost 300,000 units renting at below $750 a month to be affordable to incomes below $30,000 when people are expected to pay no more than 30% of their income. That's, that's a quote from Steve Pomeroy about the Canadian situation. Highly comparable findings have recently emerged from Australian research by Kath Hulse and colleagues um, in an Ahuri report published last year, they noticed a drastic contraction in affordable private rental housing in Australia over recent decades. To summarize, the national shortfall in affordable private rental housing that's at a price um, within the means of low income Australians, the contraction in, that, in the availability of that housing quadrupled to 212,000 over the past 15 years. So I think both of these observations um, demonstrate that the notion that lightly regulated private housing markets can be relied upon to provide adequately for low income populations has been, uh, this has been the bedrock of official thinking now for 25 years in both countries. And I'd say that surely that has now been tested to destruction. So finally, let's just say something about future prospects. Coming out of the public health crisis during the second half of 2020, I think there are immediate dangers that enhanced income support will be wound back quickly before the economy has sufficiently recovered. In coming months, with evictions having been legally suppressed for a substantial period, there's a great concern that when that uh, suppression is lifted, when that legal, those legal moratoria come to an end, there's a great concern that there will be a new homelessness wave due to rental evictions that have just been masks up until now. Only two things could moderate this. First, landlords could recognize that finding replacement tenants at current rents may be difficult. And second, that if avoidable, selling their property into a falling market could be a poor business strategy. There is a darker post pandemic scenario which is hinted at in Steve Pomeroy's earlier video, where a substantial fall in asset values because of a, of a, a flood of, 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 uh, of new housing or a, a new and existing housing coming onto the market creates conditions for mass property acquisition by investment funds, sometimes called vulture landlords. Something like this was seen in the USA and in some other countries in the wake of the post uh, global financial crisis house price crash 
which only really occurred to a sufficient degree to um, draw in vulture landlords in a few countries. In countries like Australia and Canada, that didn't really happen, or certainly not in Australia, because the fall in, in house prices after the GFC wasn't sufficient to do that. But if it did happen after this, uh, after this recession, or at the back end of this recession, that would be difficult to control by regulation. Instead, Steve Pomeroy advocates that not-for-profit landlords should be given the resources to go into the market themselves to preserve the rental affordability status of tenanted properties that might be put up for sale at bargain prices in any such future crash. In Australia, perhaps because the phenomenon of institutional ownership of rental housing still remains very unfamiliar, and also because Australia hasn't seen a significant national house price crash for 30 years, this scenario of not-for-profits going into the market or being given the resources to go into the market to buy up um, low value or lower value uh, private rental property that otherwise is going to be sold, that scenario hasn't really been contemplated. Looking to the future through a more optimistic lens, Steve identifies a post-pandemic silver lining for the housing market. This is what he says. There is potential for a healthy market correction and ideally a more balanced market with sustained lower levels of appreciation that makes it possible for individuals to access home ownership and take pressure off rental demand. And for the not-for-profit sector, opportunities through using possible stimulus investment, both expanding the non-market sector through acquisition and adding to the stock, both by building in the affordable space and in the intermediate space. So that's a possible silver lining that um, in the best possible circumstances could be the, uh, the, the way um, what we might see in the next six to 12 months. Much of this could be argued similarly for Australia, but the bigger question is whether the, the shock of this crisis can enable us to get traction with arguments for more fundamental and enduring changes in official thinking on housing and the role of government in this space. Action to tackle the tax preferenced exploitation of housing asset growth, what some people call financialization, and to rebalance housing markets should be front and center of this manifesto.